Hey everyone, welcome back. So to start off this video, I wanted to introduce this theorem right here. If 3n plus 2 is odd for some integer n, then n is odd. So this looks pretty simple, something that we can handle. You know, it's a if p then q type of statement. So we can do something like, okay, well, for a proof, let n be an integer such that 3n plus 2 is odd. Well, we can immediately apply our definition of odd here. So we'll say, by definition of odd, let k be some integer such that 3n plus 2 equals 2k plus 1. That's perfect. So now we can do the uh, do the algebra like we've been doing so far. So 3n plus 2 equals 2k plus 1, which means that subtracting both, 2 from both sides, we have 3n equals 2k minus 1. So then n equals 2k minus 1 divided by 3. Here's the problem, is that we don't know if 2k minus 1 divided by 3, we just from the information that we have here, we don't know that this is an integer. So we can't make any claims that 2k minus 1 divisible, uh, divided by 3 is in fact an integer or that 2k minus 1 is divisible by 3 at all. We can't really talk about that in this way. So because there's no guarantee for n to be an integer, there's no, there's no way we can even try to figure out that, oh, well, n is odd. So we have to approach this problem a little bit differently. So now I want to remind you of the, of the uh, fact that a conditional statement is equivalent to its contraposition. And I have the truth table here that proves this. So what we can actually do is, we've talked about this before, if we have an if p then q statement and we start transforming it using logical equivalencies, if we can prove that transformation is true, then we can prove that the original statement is true. And the same holds true for using a contraposition. If we can prove that the contraposition of a statement is true, then we can prove that the original statement is true. So a proof by contraposition If we're taking a statement, if p, then q, we're going to, the first we're going to assume that not q is true, rather than assuming p is true. Then we're basically just going to apply a direct proof to solve not q implies not p. So we're going to basically prove that not q implies not p in exactly the same way that we would do it if it was a direct proof. So this technique is going to be very similar to us, except for the fact that we're changing our assumption from p to not q. So then we'll show that not q implies not p is true using a direct proof. And then we can say thus, by proof, by contraposition, if p then q is true. So again, what we're doing here, we assume not q is true. We're applying our theorems, our definitions, axioms, any of those uh, cool things that we're allowed to use here. And then our conclusion is that, well, because we show that not q implies not p, then p must imply q by proof by contraposition because they are equivalent due to this equivalency right here. So that's the basic format that we're going to use in order to apply proof by contraposition. All right, so what I've done is I've written out some scratch work. So <clears throat> what I'm trying to figure out here is how to take this theorem that we saw at the beginning of the video and turn it into its contrapositive in order to solve a proof by contrapositive. So if p is 
3 n plus 2 is odd. The not p is 3 n plus 2 is even. This is because numbers are either only odd or only even. So a number that is um, not even is odd. Similar thing here, Q. if q is n is odd, then not q is n is even. This makes not q implies not p. If n is even, then 3n plus 2 is even. And already, this looks a lot easier to solve. So let's do it. Um, I, won't, I won't show the rest of the scratch work for this, because it will basically be the, uh, the formal proof. So let's take a look at that proof. So what we're going to do this time is we're going to say, let n be an odd integer. My bad. Okay, what we're going to do this time is we're going to write down contrapositive here to let the reader know, hey, we are using a proof of contrapositive. Then we'll start with stating what not Q is. So we'll say, let n be an even integer. immediately apply definition of even. So by definition, n equals 2k for some k in the integers. Um, I imagine I'll get some questions about this, so I'll just say that this by definition right here, I'm, I think it's reasonable to say that this uh, applies to even integer because this is the only definition we've talked about so far, and we're using this by definition right after you say even integer. So that should be fine. At least I will grade it as if it is a good explanation of why this works. Anyway, so we have that n equals 2k for some integer k. So then we can take a look at, let's see what 3n plus 2 is. Well, 3n plus 2 we can substitute. So that's uh, 3 times 2k plus 2, which would then be 6k plus 2. And then we can factor out the 2. So that's 2 times 3k plus 1. And we'll finish this off by saying something like, let m equal 2, or sorry, 3k plus 1. m is an integer because k is an integer. Then 3n plus 2 equals 2m, uh, 2 times m. So by definition, 3n plus 2 is even. So right here, we have reached not p. Now we can finish this off by restating the actual, the actual theorem. So we'll say, thus, by proof by contradiction, if 3n plus 2 is odd, then n is odd. All right, so here's another example. Uh, our theorem will be, let n, a, and b all be positive integers. If n equals a, b, then a is less than or equal to the square root of n, or b is less than or equal to the square root of n. So given that this is a proof by contraposition video, um, you might expect me to do a proof by contraposition, which I will. So if we let p be the statement n equals a b, the not p is going to be n is not equal to a b, of course. And then if q is a is less than or equal to the square root of n, or b is less than or equal to the square root of n, then we can say not q is 
So we'll have to do De Morgan's Law here. So basically it is not a is less than or equal to the square root of n or b is less than or equal to the square root of n, which is then equivalent to saying by applying to Morgan's, we can say that this is then, well, not a is less than or equal to the square root of n and not b is less than or equal to the square root of n. I know I'm, I'm kind of abusing notation here. Um, I'm just taking this very loosely given that this is, and I should probably write this out, that this is scratch work right here. But basically, we have all this by De Morgan's. And then we can simplify this. So if a is not less than or equal to the square root of n, then it must be strictly greater than. Because if we're saying the negation of this is true, then a can't be greater, or a can't be less than the square root of n, and a cannot be equal to the square root of n. So a must be greater. So we'll say a is greater than the square root of n, and b is greater than the square root of n. So what we're trying to solve here is not q implies not p, which is the statement if a is greater than the square root of n and b is greater than the square root of n, then n is not equal to a b. So let's take a look at what this is. And again, this is true I'm saying this is true because n, a, and b are positive integers, so integers that are greater than or equal to 1. So let's take a look at this theorem. Now for this one, for this proof, we're going to do some pretty tricky usage of uh, greater than signs. So bear with me, and I'm happy to explain this in class as much as possible. So what we'll do is we'll say let n, a, and b be in the set of positive integers, and suppose that a is greater than the square root of n and b is greater than the square root of n. Uh, you'll notice I didn't put contrapositive here. Honestly, I completely forgot. It's not necessary to, do, to put contrapositive after here, but it can be helpful if that's something you want to uh, keep track of or if, it's, if you want to be really clear to the reader, hey, this is what type of proof I'm doing. Normally, normally I like to do it. Sometimes I completely forget. So as long as you state it at some point, at the very least, state it at the very bottom of the proof that you're using a proof by contraposition if you don't state it up here. So anyway, we're going to suppose a and b are both greater, greater than the square root of n. So then what we'll notice that if a is greater than the square root of n, and if b is greater than the square root of n, then a times b has to be greater than the square root of n times the square root of n. So I'll take a look at what that is, So, or why that is. So we'll say n, we'll start out with n, which is equal to the square root of n times the square root of n, right? And that's just basically because of how the square root of n works. And then what we can do is you can say, well, a is greater than the square root of n, so this whole thing is going to be less than a times the square root of n, right? Because I'm basically just replacing the a with this and saying that this whole thing is greater than this whole thing. That's just because of a being greater, greater than the square root of n. We'll do the same thing over here and say that this whole thing, a, a root n, is going to be less than a times b, and this is because of our assumption that b is greater than the square root of n. So then we have that n is less than a b. So we'll say that since n is strictly less than, this is what we call a, uh, that's what I like to say when sometimes when we have a less than with no equal sign under, underneath. Uh, since n is strictly less than a b, n cannot be equal to a b. Now, if you try to work this out doing a direct proof, um, it's certainly going to be a lot harder, if not impossible, because we can't take we can't talk about the square root of n, just given that we don't know for a fact that n is, the square root of n will be an integer or not. That's that's not something we can really talk about. So 
because there's all that uncertainty with, well, this could work for any n, even if n isn't a perfect square, we need to actually take the proof by contraposition. And you know, I completely forgot the last step, so I'm going to scratch out that QED right there. And we'll say, thus, by proof by contraposition, n, uh, words, if n equals a b, then a is less than or equal to the square root of n, or b is less than or equal to the square root of n. Now, this actually has some really cool applications, this theorem right here. Um, and a lot of them have to do with things like security or stuff like that. So whenever you're trying to find prime factors of a number. So what a prime factor means is that any number can basically be turned into a multiplication of prime numbers. So let's say, I'll, I'll use this piece of paper here. Let's say we are looking at, uh, what would be a good one? 39. 39 is equal to 3 times 13. So this is the prime factorization of 39 since 3 and 13 are both prime numbers. And similarly, we could do something like 62 is equal to 2 times uh, 31, which I believe is prime as well. If I'm not, then it'd be 2 times whatever 31's prime factors are. But I'm, I'm pretty sure this is prime. Uh, I have a somewhat solid grasp of, prim of primes that far, but not much further, unfortunately. And you can have, of course, uh, numbers with multiple of the same prime in its factorization. So something like 8 equals 2 cubed. So its prime factorization is 2 times 2 times 2. Something like uh, 36 is equal to 2 squared times 3 squared. So this whole prime factorization thing is really helpful. And if you notice that in these, in all of these, all of these numbers have at least, I guess let me put it this way, um, all of these primes right here, at least one of the primes in these multiplications are smaller than the square root of the number in question. So 2 small, smaller than the square root of 62, which the square root of 62 is somewhere between 7 and 8, almost 8. Uh, 3 is smaller than the square root of 39, and so on. So when we're looking for prime factorizations in a number, if we're trying to brute force it, basically by starting at 2 and going up until and just testing every number from 2 upwards until we find numbers that are divisible uh, into the number we're trying to test, basically we can stop at the square root of that number because of a theorem like this. So if we're trying to find unique prime factorizations, you know, we can start at 2, then 3, then 4, then 5, then 6, and so on until we get to the square root of n and say, okay, but we don't need to test any numbers greater than this because otherwise we'll have seen numbers that we already got out of dividing, um, basically dividing the previous numbers that we've come across. Anyway, long-winded explanation, but this is a really nice theorem for us to have when we're talking about things like security. So yeah, that's the video on proof by contraposition. Um, thank you all for watching.